always higher, always further, always faster. We're a stressed society, a society filled with people in search of recognition, success and lasting happiness. Where doping isn't just for sports, it's for everyday life too. There's not much between self-realization and self-medication. Effective drugs are in demand. Meds to keep up, meds to get the advantage, meds to calm the emotions. Will there be a brain tuning for mind and body? Can we increase our performance with pills? Can we use pills to trigger well-being at any time? or to satisfy expectations and needs. Will our happiness depend on chemistry in the future? I recently read a headline in the newspaper that said prescription happiness. The subheading read, please doctor, I want pills to make me funny and put me in the mood. That's something many doctors are confronted with these days. Designer drugs are slightly modified versions of similar molecules that don't alter a person's consciousness with hallucinations and such like. They just lift the mood and make people happy over a short period of time. This search for happiness is something we're born with. We're hedonistic creatures, which means we avoid things we don't like and things that harm us. And this is how we came to discover drugs. People chewed plants or seeds and suddenly got a good feeling. And it's obvious that we'll repeat things that feel good. There are already drugs on the market that boost memory and performance and that calm down hyperactive children. More and more people are learning from a very young age to live with chemical substances. They mute the senses and influence personality development. To prevent the abuse of these substances, most of them are regulated and controlled. They have to be prescribed by a doctor. The demand for psychoactive substances has been increasing year on year in all classes of society. Psychiatrists consider this a consequence of accelerated and intensified living conditions. The fall, the total refusal of mind and body, that's depression. Around four million people are suffering from it in Germany alone. They're generally given antidepressants or mood lifters, says pharmacologist Gert Gleske. Around a third of these drugs are used without any medical justification. They are used because people face everyday problems, because they can swallow something to make these go away, and because people clearly expect a miracle from these drugs. Amphetamines and other stimulants, which also fight exhaustion, are anything but harmless, says neuropharmacologist Michael Koch. Interestingly, the way a drug such as modafinil works isn't that well known. I, as a pharmacologist, would call it a dirty drug because it has many docking sites in the brain. It acts via the noradrenaline system, the GABA system, the glutamatergic system as a stimulant. It twists and turns so many screws in the brain that we can't really say which systems are being influenced. Nevertheless, brain doping, tuning the neural circuits, will increasingly shape our everyday lives. 
The groups who are under particularly great pressure to be successful, managers and other leading decision makers, will be the most affected. They have the financial means required to pay for these designer drugs. It can get expensive because in the daily battle to compete, says Michael Koch, the doped brain has to achieve more and more. This suggests we're fueling a spiral, and as soon as we've pulled everyone else along, we're on one level again, and then we'll need even more to stand out again. These drug spirals have long been known about in addiction research. Users demand bigger and bigger kicks. This mechanism is already triggered in extreme sports, such as running a marathon. Because of the huge efforts made, the body produces its own opiates. The result is a rush without illegal substances. Once the body gets used to it, there are withdrawal symptoms. This is the same mechanism drug users suffer from. In the addiction center in Baal, it's no longer about getting a rush. This place treats the losers. Around 350 former heroin addicts are being given methadone. The balance sheet is impressive. Drug-related crime and HIV infection rates have fallen. The biggest problem can't be got rid of, however, addictive behavior. At first, a drug is used to calm down or alter the state of consciousness, but then the liberating feeling soon becomes familiar. The demand constantly grows and the costs spiral out of control. By the end, says Dr. Axel Jochum, the psychological and physical addictions dominate. If I take a constant level of opiates, it's like drinking my morning coffee. I feel nothing. It's simply a symbolic act. I've taken my opiate, I should feel better now. Add stress to the equation and fear, and you're once again pushed to the limit. In situations like that, there is the danger that the patients at the addiction center put their own extremely dangerous drug cocktail together. The treatment in Baal includes constant drug tests. But what happens away from medical monitoring? Is the psychological effect of drugs controllable? In search of happiness, the drugs from the 70s are back in demand again. Mushrooms containing psilocybin, or magic mushrooms, for example. At the Psychiatric University Clinic in Zurich, the effect of synthetic psilocybin has been tested in controlled laboratory conditions. The test subjects were given different quantities of the psychoactive substance and the control group was given a placebo. With this study, the researchers hope to describe the hallucinations caused by the drug and document the resulting brain processes. During the experiments, the different regions of the brain were monitored with an EEG. After the high, the experimenters, under psychiatrist Franz Save Vollenweider, documented the memories of the test subjects. Psilocybin alters sensory perception in all modalities. It alters the user's sense of sight, smell, hearing and taste by first intensifying the senses and then adding illusions to the mix. The environment changes, the colors change and these changes can be rapid. Smaller and moderate doses mostly lead to oceanic boundlessness. When the dose is increased, users can experience fear. The ratio is around 4 to 20. Moderate doses almost never produce experiences of fear. That can almost be ruled out if the test subjects are well chosen. They have to be healthy and stable, and they have to be in a safe environment. Oceanic boundlessness is the term brain researchers use to describe the condition where there is no I anymore. 
People who are psychologically unstable have a much higher risk of experiencing horror trips than stable people. If the trip is negative, the same areas of the brain are activated as in acutely schizophrenic patients. We paid special attention to what the biological and biochemical mechanisms and what the receptor mechanisms of these changes were. We were able to show that specific receptors are responsible and if they are blocked, these symptoms drastically decrease or are eliminated completely. This can teach us, using healthy people, what could happen in sick people. While scientific drug experiments can contribute to the development of therapies, the goal of drug users tends to be to achieve a feeling of happiness that lasts as long as possible. But what defines this sense of happiness? And can it really only be obtained by using chemical substances, whether natural or synthetic? Oceanic boundlessness gives people the feeling of being in eternity, of being at one with the environment. It's a longing to be at one with the world, and that's what people are also trying to achieve when they meditate. You stop reflecting. The self is simply embedded in a greater self, which we may experience as a transpersonal self. Buddhists report the same effect. And if you examine monks with similar methods, which we did, then they report very similar experiences to good psilocybin trips. The overlap was incredible. There is a spiritual center in southern Germany run by the Benedictine monk and Zen master Willigis Jäger. He has been meditating every day since 1945. Going inside of himself is an important part of his life. level of consciousness can be achieved through meditation. Does the spiritual path help optimize our consciousness? First, meditation takes you to the problems of your own life. You are confronted with yourself. A lot of injuries and problems come to the surface. It's important to accept these problems, but not to engage with them. Meditation also helps people heal, but it mainly expands people's horizons. It aims at illuminating some background of a person that reveals that person's true self, which is otherwise covered up by personal containment and rationality. We're something completely different than our personal structure would have us believe. It's very important that fear is accepted. If I can accept it and find a deeper connection, find the background behind it, the fear will go away. That reduces my stress levels and I become calmer. Actual healing comes from being calm. It's not that I do something with the stress, it's the tranquility that does something with me and that takes the stress away. It's always about stepping out of personal containments. That's the actual mystical experience, the actual Zen experience, the experience of emptiness, which isn't just empty, but which is filled with individual structures, such as voices from the outside, feelings from within and intentions. Loneliness and individualization are not the goals of Zen teaching. 
For Willigis Jäger, it's the marketplace to which everyone keeps returning. Meditation broadens people's horizons. Is the experience of stepping out of personal containment comparable to psilocybin experiences? The drug gives a containment, a parameter from which we don't usually escape, while a true experience provides crystal clear insight. The drug is confining because you're stuck in certain parameters. Achieving a state of trance without drugs, that's neural enhancement at a high level. Consciousness versus chemistry. But many drugs weren't born in company labs. They have their origin in nature. Naturopaths have many an ingredient in their cupboards that amaze lay people. Many of the remedies used in homeopathy are either toxic or harmful to health in their original state. But the substances are diluted to such a degree that these toxic components are hardly measurable anymore. Homeopaths even successfully use placebos because when it comes to treating diseases, medications aren't everything, says pharmacologist Julia Kirchheiner. Ideally, doctors should accompany the healing process. And of course, it's not just the drug by itself that has an effect, it's also the way in which the patient is looked after and accompanied, and how the patient is informed about the treatment strategy. And so the doctor, as a person, is of fundamental importance and cannot be replaced by some Internet pharmacy. When it comes to homeopathic remedies, trust in the doctor and belief in the effect of the medications are particularly important for the success of a treatment, because the placebo effects stimulate the body's own immune system, and the fear of side effects is minimal. And so, when it comes to naturopathic remedies, the trend is towards self-medication. The demand is increasing, both regarding quantity and areas of application. According to spokesperson Wolfgang Kern, the Hale company now only produces second-generation substances, modern complex drugs with more than one active ingredient. We're assuming that homeopathy and naturopathic remedies will become very much more accepted over the next few decades. There are already studies by the Consumer Research Society that state that 20% of Germans fully trust homeopathy. That means every fifth person already accepts it. According to a survey of doctors in the top German soccer league, the Bundesliga, 92% of all players also use homeopathic treatment. The remedies are mainly used for infections and to regenerate their valuable legs. The reason they're so popular is because they are successful and are not considered doping. But natural remedies aren't harmless either. They affect the mind and the metabolism, warned psychologist Paul Enk. St. John's wort, and this has been demonstrated in the past 10 years, has an antidepressant effect. Since that has been known, there have been many St. John's wort products out there that aren't being produced in some small herb garden anymore. The pharmaceutical industry has made it its goal to incorporate these products into its range. I can buy St. John's wort in the drugstore, and it has side effects. It increases sensitivity to sunlight. The greater problem is that it leads to other medications being metabolized more quickly. This can lead to interferences with other medications that are used in immune defense after an organ transplant, for example. They suddenly stopped working and the body rejected the organ because patients are taking St. John's wort more and more often without speaking to a doctor first. Pharmacologist Julia Kirchheiner recommends not taking more than two or three drugs at the same time in order to keep their mutual interactions to a minimum. A drug's effect is also influenced by a person's genetic disposition and metabolism, as well as by the patient's tolerance for it. But the most important factor is the dosage.
Even in antiquity, people knew that the dose was crucial. Higher doses carry a higher risk of side effects of all kinds, including side effects on the central nervous system, such as tiredness, confusion, and changes to the patient's consciousness. Apnea can also be a side effect. To what extent a high dose is dangerous has to be assessed for every medication individually. There are drugs that can be taken in high doses and there are drugs that have to be taken in low doses because they quickly become toxic at higher levels. With these, I have to be particularly careful to choose the right dose for the patient. Natural remedies, psychiatric medications, illegal drugs, they all promise fast cures and alter the user's state of consciousness. Anyone looking at the future should ask, how can I cope with stress and conquer fears? How can I confront pressure to succeed? And how can I realize myself without medications? The market for psychoactive substances is growing, and therefore also the temptation to take them, says neuropharmacologist Walter Ziegel-Gensberger. Addiction is the desire to take a substance in order to achieve a condition that is usually detached and considered pleasant, which ultimately leads to all other activities becoming secondary and all energies become directed towards this addiction and acquiring the drug. Everything is given up, jobs, friends, just to get the desired drug. When someone is high, feelings are triggered that the brain remembers. It stores the information that leads to this sense of well-being. If a stressful situation is followed by a pleasant period of relaxation, the body's reward system is triggered. A complex interplay between mind and emotion is ignited in the brain, as this computer animation at the Max Planck Society shows. Especially in connection with addiction, we first teach the brain to take drugs. We take the drug which makes us see things through rose-tinted spectacles and suddenly the world looks quite different. Our brain remembers that and says, OK, if you want to feel good again, you should take this pill again. The brain doesn't say, it'll end really badly or you'll get used to it and addicted to it one day. All it says is, it's good for your fears and for your mood. The pleasurable experiences that result from regularly taking such substances leave deep marks in the brain's memory. It is very difficult to delete this information, says addiction expert Walter Ziegel-Gensberger. That's why he is for retraining. Old brain structures can be altered through new experience processes. If I give a patient a single substance and I leave the patient alone with the substance's effect without talking to him or her, that's not enough. The strongest psychiatric medicine of all is words. We can access the brain very quickly with words and they can have a lasting effect. We can really hurt someone with words or we can make them feel good. Treating someone with psychiatric drugs is only a good idea in this context. Pharmacologists such as Gerd Glesker and Michael Koch warn that if we try to find happiness in pills, we're doomed to fail, because the boundary between healing remedies and drugs is blurring. They become drugs when you are no longer treating a disease. Of course, these are psychotropic substances that affect the mind, like heroin and cocaine. If they're not treating a disease, then they are drugs that are abused as doping substances in our everyday lives. One of the great foreseeable dangers for this potential pharmacological future is that we will stop acting and will instead just withdraw into virtual worlds 
or into the worlds these substances create for us. We could stop being protagonists, people in a social setting. What do psychoactive substances do to us? Will we be nothing but pharmaceutically controlled beings? Can we be made quiet through drugs? Maybe the biggest risk of addiction lies in our longing for success and happiness.